I understood. I understood what had happened. What had happened is the monastic voice had emerged. So those of you who have meditated, and I assume that includes all of you, have become aware of the plethora of inner voices. Many, many voices. We're all made up of many energies and many voices. Really, the voices are the same. It's just what each personality is made up of a different recipe of those energies or those voices. And one of them is the monastic voice. Uh, almost every person, I'm convinced, has a monastic voice. At our monastery, we regularly get telephone calls from complete strangers who blurt out, I've decided that I want to get ordained. How quickly can I get ordained there? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> We've actually been warned against middle-aged men whose wives have either left them or died, who don't know how to do their own laundry or cook, and decide suddenly they have a monastic vocation. <laughs> so we get calls like that. Somebody who's determined to get ordained and wants to do it next week uh, at the latest. And we tell them, well, it's actually rather complicated. There's a long training period, and you're welcome to come visit for a day and see the monster if you wish. And we never hear from them again. <laughs> and we know, if we look at ourselves, how hard is it to change ourselves? It's extremely difficult to fundamentally change yourself. So why in the world do we think that we can change people 3,000 miles away, like the President of the United States? Really, the only person we have a hope of transforming in a significant way is ourselves, and that's extremely difficult. But that's where it starts, because when we transform everyone we come in contact with, and even people that we're not directly in contact with, change. Because we are, uh, the analogy I use is that we are essentially the empty space in a big mass of bubbles. You consider a bunch of soap bubbles, and each bubble is made up of the intersection of all the other bubbles. And so we're the emptiness in the middle of that. So when any bubble changes, including us, then they all have to change. And that's how practice works. That's the miracle of practice. So the first principle of family practice is the best way to encourage our family and friends to practice is to practice ourselves and to embody the benefits of practice. We can bring that benefit to those we love much more through inspiration. That's really how people change. They're inspired to change, not forced to change, not cajoled to change. My uh, first husband began meditating before I did. He was a university professor under a lot of stress to perish or publish. And uh, some of his students said, oh, there's another professor who's meditating. You might want to go learn from him. So he learned, and I actually fell asleep because I was an intern at the time, uh, working you know, 70 hour days. And I fell asleep under the coffee table while he learned to meditate. But for the next year, he got up every morning early and would go in the living room and sit facing the wall as our, as, as our want and so does in, and meditate. And often the baby would get up and crawl into the living room and then crawl over to his dad and look up in his dad's face and then look over at the wall. <laughs> look up at his dad's face and look at the wall. And then finally crawl up in, into his dad's lap and then fall asleep. And I was so impressed with the changes in my husband over a year of meditation that I began meditating too. See, that's how we inspire people. <laughs> there are many things that we predicted that, there are many things we didn't predict that they ended up doing. At a gathering of Zen teachers once, I was talking about this very thing, and what, what did our kids become to get us? And uh, one, one woman who said, well, my, my daughter is a porn star. <laughs> and I thought, boy, we never thought of that one. <laughs>